You're listening to Create Zen Habits, an Optimal Living interview with Leo Babauta and Brian Johnson. Hi guys, this is Brian. Welcome back to the Optimal Living 101 interview series. Today I'm going to be chatting with Leo Babauta, just learned how to say Leo's last name, from the incredibly cool and popular site Zen Habits. If you're one of the few people who haven't heard of Leo at this point, cruise on over to zenhabits.net and get your wisdom on with Leo's great blend of super practical, inspiring, and grounded insights. Leo, thanks for taking the time to chat. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, I'd love to kick it off with um, Habits. Your Zen Habits, such an extraordinary website. Tell us about Zen Habits, why are habits important, and we'll talk about some good tips on how to go about building habits. Sure. Well, you know, Zen Habits really was a way for me to share some of the things I've been learning um, about changing my habits. Uh, I, I was in a place about seven years ago where I was just kind of stuck and I, I couldn't make changes. I felt helpless to, to do any of the things that I wanted to do. I felt like I had no discipline. Uh, no discipline. I, was, I felt guilt about failing all the time. And so... I learned a lot about how to change habits, and when I finally figured out how to do it, it just kind of clicked, and it was uh, it was kind of amazing uh, that like a certain small set of principles could you know be repeated to form basically any habit that I wanted to form. And so I learned that the key to changing my life was changing my habits, and um, that really just changed everything. My, my life is completely different now, seven years later. And I'm so happy that I've learned these things. So I'm just really happy to be able to share them with people. Yeah, that's amazing. And I know you've shared them with so many people. What, what are some of the, the top distinctions that you made in terms of how to effectively set habits and create new yeah. habits? Yeah, well, there's a, there's a small set of things that I've learned. Uh, one, one thing that's really important is just doing one change at a time. And uh, So many people do a lot at a time uh, or try to do too many at a time. And it's a good recipe for failure. So that's that's been a big change for me. Um, focus on one at a time. Start small and progress really gradually. And that sounds really obvious, but a lot of people don't do it. Uh, they try and go out and exercise at the gym for half an hour to 45 minutes. Um, when they haven't been exercising, they don't have the habit down yet. So we get the habit down first by doing just like five to ten minutes each time. And then once the habit is is kind of set, then you can kind of expand from there. Mm -hmm. um, I learned a lot about triggers, um, how to tie your habit to a trigger. I learned about uh, building positive reinforcement into the habit and just really learning to enjoy the habit. And a lot about social accountability and, and how that really helps you to stick to the habit for longer, for long enough for it to become a habit. Hmm, very cool. So I'd love to unpack those a little bit more. So doing one change at a time, get it. And again, we all get so excited, especially around the New Year's when we're recording this. We want to change everything. But let's pick one thing, kind of that keystone habit. Focus on that. Starting small. We didn't say that, but I'll kind of throw that in. Starting small and progressing you know, from those small, gradual changes. And then you kind of went through quickly the last three of those top five. Um, tying habits to triggers. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so I think a lot of people don't really understand how, the, you know, the mechanism of how habits work. But it's, you know, for example, when I was quitting smoking, I um, had to make a list of the triggers. And this is based on a lot of research on habits that I, I didn't know about, but I learned about at that time, was that each time I smoked, it was because there was something that triggered it, a cue that, that told me, you know, this is time to, it's time to smoke, and you know, then the urge, the, the inner urge came up once that trigger went off. Hmm. Um, you know, stress is a big one. And that's, stress is, can be a trigger for smoking, but also for lots of other bad habits like shopping or going to your, you know, procrastinating or eat, overeating. Checking like, email. <laughs> yeah. yeah, chewing your nails. Yep. You know, there's all kinds of things that we do as a response to the trigger of stress. Hmm. And so uh, if you want to quit the bad habit, you have to find a good habit to replace the same need for uh, the bad habit when the trigger comes up. Uh, and so you have to kind of make a list of all your triggers. Now, when you're forming a good habit just from scratch, not replacing a bad habit, it's a good idea to find something that's already in your routine that you do on a daily basis. For example, I wake up and I might drink a cup of coffee. 
uh, that cup of coffee could, since it's already in my routine, can be a trigger for a new good habit, let's say meditation. So I would basically do the, the trigger first, which is the drink of the cup of coffee, and then right after, like immediately after, do the meditation. Now, in the beginning, there's no urge to do the meditation after the coffee, so it has to be a real conscious thing. You have to have like a reminder out there, just really put a lot of focus and energy into doing the habit right after the trigger. But after a certain number of repetitions, and that there's a lot of variability depending on different factors of how many repetitions that takes, but after a certain number of repetitions, you start to feel an urge to do the habit after the trigger happens. And so it becomes more and more automatic. You don't even need to remind yourself that you know, like, okay, I had the coffee, time to go do the meditation. Hmm. Um, so in the beginning, you have to be real conscious about that. Um, but it's, it's really not that hard if you, you know, like you said, start small. And let's say the meditation is only two minutes a day. Mm-hmm. It's not that hard to do the meditation right after the coffee. But once you've built that urge in, like that urge has developed after a certain number of repetitions, then you can start to, you know, it's it's automatic to go sit on the cushion. So you can extend that two minutes to five minutes, seven minutes, 10 minutes, and so on. Yep. That's cool. And then, so when you are setting the the new habit, and we're going to talk about goals too, and just kind of how we set goals in the context of, of how you're approaching things these days, but how would you frame that in your mind? If you want to change a behavior, do you set a goal about that or you just make a commitment to do something? How do you approach that or how do you recommend we approach that? Yeah, well, I, I love the idea of doing habits instead of goals. So if you want to, you know, if your goal is to you know, run a marathon, then what are the habits that it takes to, to mm. get to that goal? Yep. Right? So the, the daily running training could be the, the habit, and so you start building that up, and the, the goal can be met, you know, just from in, implementing that habit. So that's uh, awesome. Yeah, yeah, figure out what the, the actions are that's going to take the habit that's going to take to get to the goal that you want to get to. Well, let's let's take that tangent because when I asked my community some questions they'd like me to ask you, goals was kind of at the top of the list. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit and go <laughs> into that. Um, so. You know, my, my joke that I had in my notes here was, what do you have against goals? <laughs> and okay. kind of talking about that. But let's, let's, let's kind of step back and just hear, I'd love to hear your high-level philosophy on goals. And then we can kind of go back and look at changing our lives, optimizing our lives via habit creation as it relates to it. Can you kind of sure. share with me that? Well, when I started Set Habits as an example, I, I was really goal-oriented. In fact, I had been for a long time, like goals and, and you know, setting the, the tasks to get to those goals and like daily and uh, weekly reminders uh, or checklists to get to those goals it was a big part of my life. So I had these big goals for 2007 when I started Zen Habits. And at the beginning of the year, I had this picture in my mind of how this year was going to turn out. Um, and at the end of that year, none of that had happened. <laughs> Mm-hmm. It was completely different. The, my idea of what was going to happen at the beginning of the year was completely different than what actually happened. Now, let's take 2012 as an example, that, the year that just passed. In the beginning of the year, I had no idea and I had no set expectations of what was going to happen. And at the end of the year, I also, you know, the same thing turned out was that, you know, I, I, what, what actually happened was, was completely different than, than what I could have imagined at the beginning of the year. And so in both cases, the year was unpredictable. I had no real control over it other than do, do my best each day and see what happens. Um, you know, events will happen. Things will come up. Oppor- opportunities will open themselves to, your, to you as you go. And you can't predict any of that. And so this illusion of control that we have when we set goals is completely an illusion. We don't really control our lives in that you know, to that degree that we think we do. Yep. Um, and so I learned in the first couple of years of Zen Habits that setting goals was a waste of time because it turned out the way that, it, that I wanted it to. Mm-hmm. Um, and it also took up a lot of uh, maintenance, a lot of management time to manage those goals and a lot of stress about not meeting them, a lot of guilt if I failed one week and didn't make the goals for that week. Um, and what I learned is when I let go of them, I could still accomplish the same amount of things, but without all the stress and time that it took to manage those goals. Yep. 
So then one of the ways that I was trying to frame kind of how we can help understand uh, how you approach it now was to imagine, you know, rewinding 10 years when, you know, you talk a lot about so candidly and transparently, you're, you were in debt, you were overweight, you were smoking, you weren't exercising. How would you approach those challenges with your current insight today from that vantage point 10 years ago? Yeah, I think I mean, that's a great question. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've learned is that you, if you can focus on the actual activity rather than where you want to end up, that's the most important thing. So if your goal is to get out of debt, that's a great goal. It's obviously not accomplishable today. I can't do that goal today. But what I can do is focus on the financial habits that will make my financial life better. So if, my, you know, if I want to shop less and spend less, then I can focus on that activity and instead replace it with free stuff that I can enjoy more. You know, we've talked about meditation and exercise, spending time with my family, reading, writing, mm-hmm. all those things I can do without spending money. Yep. So the goal is, is not something I can do today, but today I can do free stuff instead of shopping. Yep. I can start you know, paying down my debt today um, I can't pay the entire thing today. That's a goal that I cannot accomplish today, but I can start paying things on time. I can start making a list of all the debts that I have, Yep. Um, all the bills that I have. Maybe put the, the debts and bills on auto pay. Maybe start saving a small emergency fund. Those actual actions I can start putting into action today. And the goal, I mean, where I end up as a result of those actions isn't as important as really putting myself into the actions that, you know, that make me feel good, that make me feel healthier, that uh, make me happier. Yep. So then it's kind of like letting the, so we have the intention, we can call it a goal or not to get out of debt, but either way, the most important thing is to focus, as you said, on the activities rather than the outcome and to really focus on those day in and day out, let's do our best each day and kind of let the goal or the outcome be a byproduct of that behavior. Is that a fair yeah, and the thing is, too, is we, we don't really know what the outcome is going to be. We might think we want to be debt-free, but as a result of these activities that we're putting into place, we might be debt-free in five years or in two years or mm-hmm. in one year. Yep. Uh, we, might be, we might have you know, $1,000 in, in savings or we might have $100,000. Know, we have no idea yep. Yep. at this point. So the outcome is completely unpredictable, and so just – Letting go of worrying about what that outcome is, instead worry about you know the things that we're going to do right now that either are going to be helpful to us or not helpful. Yep. So then, just to go into a little bit more granular on this, let's say I am in debt and I do have the aspiration slash goal to not be in debt. And using, would you is that okay in your model? I know you're totally cool with everyone needs to approach it the way that they need to approach it. Sure. But would you say, okay, that's great to have that goal of being out of debt. As you said, it's a good goal. Um, or would you reframe that even? Well, I mean, I think that's fine to have your, that goal. But, uh, you know, I think what you want to really look at, because, I mean, that, these goals that we have, they're just basically fantasies. <laughs> yep. And uh, they, they aren't really tied to reality. You know, I want to have this beautiful house and a wonderful job in five years or, or whatever it is that my goals are. That's a fantasy. It's not a, a real thing that's going to happen. But what you can do is look at what you're doing right now. Yep. So you can have that goal. That's fine. But uh, just realize that that's not something that, you know, it, it doesn't motivate your actions right now uh, because you can't get to that goal right now. And so what, what really motivates your actions are is the spending that I'm doing right now, the going out and shopping to relieve my stress, is that really giving me the satisfaction that I want? Is it making me happy? Is it putting me in a better place in life? And so really examine the current activities that you, you've been doing recently and the ones that you're going to do right now today. Yep. Um, and, and take a look at, at what the effects they, they're having on you. So you kind of pay closer attention to that. Sometimes you, know, you, know, you might think this is going to give me uh, a reward for my hard work. And so you go out and shop or you go out and eat a lot of, of junk food. But look at how you feel after that. Do you really feel satisfied or is, you know, um, or is that just an empty feeling that you get um, and a temporary pleasure 
uh, you know, from those activities. And if so, maybe you can drop those activities and do things that are more fulfilling that can also give you the relief of stress. Yep. That's great. I guess I'm trying to hold it in my mind of, you know, is it really either or, or is it more just a kind of a refocusing of where the energy goes? Because so often we get so obsessed with the goals. I know I have, and as you're describing your experience of kind of the disappointment when we don't hit them inevitably, and it's always going to be different, um, but kind of holding it lightly of, okay, yeah, that's the general direction I want to go. And I know it's not going to be precisely that. Um, and then what do I need to do today such that that an outcome like that will be the natural byproduct of the habits that I'm showing up and, and, uh, and doing joyfully day in and day out. Yeah, and I think that's fine. Uh, I think when I, I don't think there's any problem with having goals. I think the problem that we have is we really believe in their power. Mm -hmm. um, and so, sure, you want to be out of debt, um, and there's nothing wrong with that, with wanting that. Uh, but yep. but you know the the thing is, take a look at whether that's you know that desire for this certain outcome is really giving you the things that you think it's giving you and maybe try going without it. So what happens when I let go of it? Um, and then, you know, again, focus on what you're doing right now and, and today. Yep. Um, instead. Right on. So then just to come back one more time. So then if you were going to um, get in shape, right, you were, you were overweight and you weren't exercising and you were smoking, tell me your version again, just to give that specific um, example, how you would approach it. Yeah, well, you can't get in shape today, right? Yep. <laughs> so what you what you can do is do the things that that um, make you healthier, and so you can go out for a walk with a friend, and uh, go for a nice walk and get some movement rather than sitting all day and watching TV or eating junk food. You can uh, replace that junk food that you might have been eating with something healthier that tastes delicious and enjoy that activity, and so you can repeat those actions and. And notice the feelings that you get after and during the, the eating and the walking or the going for a run or doing a few push-ups. How does that make you feel? And really focus on repeating the activities that, that truly give you satisfaction and make you feel healthier and put you in a better place and make you happier. Uh, rather than doing the things that give you temporary pleasure but really make you feel bad afterward. Yeah. Uh, and so if you can do that... Uh, that that includes, like I said, you know, some kind of activity, exercise, and some kind of eating. The problem is if you do it because you, you think it's going to get you six-pack abs or lose a lot of weight, and you do it, what happens afterward? After you're done, do you have those six-pack abs? No, you look at your stomach and it's still flabby. Yeah. So you say, well, I did this and it didn't work. Well, of course you know that it's not going to work right away. So you do it the next day and, the, and two weeks later and six weeks later, maybe you still don't have those six-pack abs. And so if your motivation is to hit a certain outcome and you don't get to those out, that outcome in six weeks, then your motivation starts to flag because you don't, I mean, the, the thing that you're, you're hoping for, this positive reward, is way off in the future and, and you never know if it's actually going to come. You might not hit that goal. And so what you want to do is be motivated by the actual positive reinforcement of the activity. And so if you go out and go for a walk and you feel good about that, that's an immediate thing that, that you can get right now. And there's no waiting for, for 10 months for that. It's right now as you're doing it. Yep. And that's really a, a be much better motivator for sticking to something. Um, and that's what I found is that when I have this long-term goal, it's hard to stay motivated for long enough to make it a habit. But if I enjoy the habit each and every time that I do it and I focus on that rather than the outcome that I want, then you're going to stay motivated for long enough for it to stick. Right on. And that's, that's the fourth of your five ideas we led this off with of the positive reinforcement. So that's where we get the positive reinforcement is not the rat racing someday in the future we're going to get this reward. But look, I feel great right now doing this. Is that fair? Yes, absolutely. And you should do that every single time. Get that positive reinforcement every single time you do the habit. If you do it because you, you think this is a necessary chore that you need to get through to get to this goal – you're going to hate it, and you can't stick to something that you hate for very long. <laughs> That's awesome. And now, when you set, so then the goal, if you will, to use the word, becomes enjoy the habits, essentially. Yes. 
<laughs> you can call it a goal. I call it a principle. Got it. <laughs> the intention, whatever, whatever word we want to use, akin to that. Just, it's something that works. Yep. That, that's basically how I think of it. That's great. That's fantastic. Well, thanks for helping me unpack that. And, um, and it's, then, a, it's a tough uh, thing because we're, I think we are, it's ingrained in us to, to want to have goals. So it's, it's tough for me to explain this. It's concept of people. Well, I think, and again, you know, in the context of a 30 minute chat, it's challenging. We can talk about this for a long time, obviously. And just when I teach goals, first thing I do is I separate extrinsic versus intrinsic goals. So if your goal is a six pack of abs and the house on the beach and, you know, you on the best seller list, well, those are extrinsic goals. We know scientifically you're going to be less psychologically stable than people who are committed to intrinsic goals that, to your point, give us joy now, which is deepening our relationships, growing as a human being, and making a contribution, and doing right. so autonomously. So that's kind of how I start it. And then I go into, I love the way you frame it. Um, I call them creative production goals, but habits is a much better way to describe it. <laughs> the things you're going to do in the process, such that the outcome is a natural byproduct. Um, and then holding that tension. One other question that I had on that on this theme was, do you think that your kind of being a goals ninja is what allowed you to kind of let it go? And do you think that people may need to actually reach a certain level of expertise in managing themselves and setting goals before they kind of let go into the freedom of no goals? Or do you think you can just jump straight into the no goal scenario? I, I, I get that a lot uh, where people think, well, because you're so great at goals, then you can let it go. So you have to get to a certain point. Um, and I, I think I could see the the thinking behind that, the, the wanting to believe that. But what I would encourage you to do is just try it. Go a week or two weeks. Two weeks. You can do two weeks without a goal. And instead focus on the activities and how they make you feel. And uh, do those activities that are you know, enjoyable, um, not for the short-term pleasure, but for the full satisfaction that they give you. Um, and then see what happens. And I, I've challenged other people to do this, people who are not goals ninjas, and they've, they've loved it and actually have thrived in that kind of environment. So yep. the reason why I know that it's I, – at first I, I had the same question. Like maybe it was just good for me at that point to let go of goals, but I couldn't have done it you know, seven years ago. But seeing other people give it a try who were not you know, great at goals – um, and really thrive in it. I, I know now that it's possible. I don't know if it's going to work for every single person, mm-hmm. but I know that other people can do it whether you're good at goals or not. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with that. I think that we all need to find our approach that works for us. Personally, I kind of like the idea of yes and, where goals are still fun for me when I let go of the attachment to any particular outcome. And, you know, we've not achieved our explicit goals so many times that after a while, you just have to embrace the reality that it's never going to turn out the way you think. Um, but I still have fun kind of imagining that perspective and then also enjoying this moment in the process um, yep. and having that freedom and dynamic. But I think ultimately what goes through your work is test it out, try it, experiment yeah. with it, see what works, right? And I think we're largely talking about the same things, me and you. We just have maybe different words for them sometimes. <laughs> um, but one thing that that's interesting is like if you, if you use the, the goal kind of a mindset that you're using, which is, which is fine. I think it's great. Like kind of hold lightly to those goals, you know, like use them maybe to give you a direction and be, be willing to let go of them if things don't turn out the way that you thought they were going to turn out or if you know, a door opens up that you couldn't have foreseen. So you, you're not going to go the same direction, maybe change directions mid course, but you still have fun and the outcome is still great. Either yes. way. In my intuition is that, that I, I, my intuition is, and you've thought about this longer than I have, that that's actually kind of beyond the, okay, let's only set goals and be attached to them and fail. Let's not set goals and just kind of be in the moment. Then let's set goals but not be attached to them and be in the moment. That kind of yep. seems to be that, again, intuitively, just personally, where I, I kind of feel that sense of rightness. The middle path. <laughs> well, and kind of beyond the beyond path. So it's kind of this, then that, then there's the integration of both. Um, yep which kind of transcends and includes both perspectives in a way. What I found too, the, um, and maybe this is going a little deeper than most people are going to do right away, but what I found now is I, I do find myself, you know, just kind of unconsciously setting goals. And I have to kind of pay attention to that. And I say, well, okay, I have this goal of, you know, like, let's say six pack abs. 
And that, that's great, uh, but why do I have it? Like, what is kind of motivating that? Why do I have this kind of, again, a fantasy of achieving this outcome? And when I realize that it's a fantasy and I realize I don't really need it to, to do the things that, I, that make me feel good and make me healthy, I can let go of it. And so it's kind of a, a process of, okay, I set the goal, but then I kind of examine it, what's, mm -hmm. go what's going on behind it. Yep. And allow myself to let go of it and just see what happens without it. Hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and then for me, I would come back and frame that as an intention to move out of the extrinsic six-pack into the, well, you know what? I want to have more optimal energy so I can show up more fully in my relationships and my creative work, et cetera. And I'm going to enjoy walking with my family or whatever other activity I engage in on a daily basis and focus on those habits that you're so passionate about um, yeah. and that I'm obviously so concurrent with. So fun stuff. This is where I wish we had, I like to joke, a good weekend to talk about things. <laughs> Uh, and it's funny, too, because I'm interviewing a woman named Heidi Grant Halverson tomorrow who is all about the science of goal setting. So what goes into human motivation? So I'm excited to kind of um, be able to hold all of this um, and really appreciate your perspective and the experimentation you've done um, and how you're leading the path in this regard. So um, great stuff. Well, we've got uh, a bit more time. We've actually a fair amount of time. would love to hear. So let's, let's kind of pivot to... We talked about habits. We talked about goals. Tell me about minimalism. Talk to me about the idea of simplifying our lives, why it's so important and why it's so challenging for most of us. <laughs> yeah, it's a, another big topic. But uh, it, it's, to me, it's, it's similar to what we were just talking about, about being able to examine why we have things, why we're holding on to things, and, and experiment with letting them go. Uh, but the, the big picture is that I started to experiment with minimalism when I realized I just had too much stuff and all of that stuff, you know, I got them because of fantasy. They thought they were going to make my life better or make me feel better, but really they were weighing me down. And so just kind of watching that process of acquiring them, not getting the satisfaction that I wanted out of them, and then just watching them weigh me down and clutter up my life and give me some, you know, visual stress and all kinds of maintenance that I had to do to, to keep them in my life, I realized that letting go of them was actually much more beneficial. And so letting go of stuff just was a huge relief. And I would just go through and just start clearing out a closet, making <laughs> a room have almost nothing in it, and realizing that you know there, th none of that stuff made me happy and, and I didn't need any of it. And you think you do, maybe it you think it gives you security or maybe it has some kind of sentimental value. But letting go of it leaves you with just the things that are essential in life. And th those are very few. <laughs> so the, when it's, an, it's an experiment of kind of looking at something and saying, does this really, do I really need this? Does it bring happiness to my life? Can I let go of it? And what would life be like without it? Hmm. And you can just kind of repeat that experiment over and over. And that's not just with possessions. But with the things that we do in our lives, the online stuff, the email, the Facebook, the, you know, all the blogs we might read, um, the news we watch, the, all the tasks that we find ourselves doing each day, just watch all that stuff and see, can I let this go? And what we're left with is very little, but they're the essential things, the things that are really valuable to us. And we can now have the space to give those the attention that they deserve, the time that they deserve. Hmm. So for me, it's about not only the physical clutter, but mental clutter and time clutter and just kind of getting rid of that and giving yourself some space. Yeah, that's awesome. I know you teach a whole class on clutter-free living, which people can learn more about. Um, I know they can go to Zen Habits, but where else can they go for that? Uh, that one is called clutterfreecourse.com. Okay. And we also have a you know, an ebook if you want to just read an e a book about it. Uh, and then I have, if you go to zenhabits.net, you can pretty much find everything on my books and courses page. So I've got different books and a couple different courses. Awesome. And then we're going to have to have a whole other conversation about this. Um, I know you started the chat with Alexandra, my wife, about your unschooling and natural it's, learning. Can you give me a quick, just kind of minute or two on that? It's basically the minimalist uh, version of learning <laughs> for, for kids mostly, but I think as adults too. And if you look at you and I as adults, we basically learn things on our own because they're interesting to us and you know we really want to learn about them. And so we're motivated to learn and this is how people really learn. But in school, it's an unnatural way of learning, you know, for most schools, I'm generalizing of course, but 
you're basically put into a classroom um, and told this is what you need to learn. Of course, you don't know why you need to learn it, but these guys, this authority tells you you need to learn it. They give you the information. You have to digest it and spit it back out on a test or a paper. And you repeat that over and over until you get to the end of your schooling and you basically didn't care about any of it. You just went through the motions, which I think is the wor absolute worst way to learn. And it's the worst message that you can teach kids the worst lesson you can teach them about learning, because learning is fantastic, it's fun, it's exciting, it's enriching, and, and they're taught that it's boring, and it's something you have to do to get through it, and get through the day until you can do what you really want to do, which is not learning, which is not true, because they're learning when they're not in school, too, but they're not told that, they're told that, you know, that stuff is play, and you shouldn't do that, you should st focus on the learning stuff that you hate doing. So, unschooling, basically, is... <laughs> All of that out the door and learning like you and I learn as adults and as entrepreneurs learn, as you know, people who are creating their own lives learn, people who are changing their habits learn, which is find stuff that you, that you give a crap about and learn how to learn it on your own. And you don't need some authority figure to teach you how to do that. You can do it on your own and you're empowered to do that. And you're, you know how to figure stuff out for yourself. You know how to make decisions for yourself. You know how to teach yourself what to do, schedule your time. Uh, motivate yourself. And that's something that kids do not learn in most schools. And when, by the time they get to be adults, they're basically trained to only do what they're told and not figure stuff out for themselves or motivate themselves in any way other than to get through the end of the day so they can go home and <laughs> relax and not work. Um, and, and as you and I know, that work can be just as much fun. Work is learning. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something that you just need to get through to get a paycheck. But it can be so much fun, and, and you can motivate yourself, and you can set your schedule, and all, all kinds of great stuff, but that's not what you're taught in school. So unschooling is really teaching us how to be like, like you and I are. So great. Well, again, I look forward to continuing that conversation. I know you have six kids, um, and uh, one of the other questions someone had was, how in the world does he create everything he creates when I only have two kids and he's got six kids? <laughs> <laughs> that you, that you, uh, you, know, you and your wife are, are unschooling as well. So, well, they go hand in hand. I mean, just yeah. I don't know if we're out of time here. but I've got as much time as you've got, so I want to respect your time. Sure. Yeah, well, I love talking about this stuff. I could probably talk all weekend, too. So. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, I mean – if you can teach the kids to learn on their own and teach themselves, I mean, that's a difficult process because you have to kind of walk through it with them. But, you know, and you can also set an example for them, like, again, like you and I are doing. And, uh, you know, you set the example of how fun it is to learn and how to learn on your own and teach yourself stuff. And then the kids start doing it on their own and you can kind of let them do it. And you just kind of check in with them and help them through sticky points and, um, do stuff with them when you have time, but a lot of times you teach them to be self-sufficient learners, and then you can go and do your work while they're doing their learning. Um, and that doesn't happen right away, of course. Um, it's it's some work, yeah. <laughs> but uh, that's what we try and do, and we try and do that with them, like in all areas of their life, not just school uh, stuff, but like you know, teaching themselves to cook and dress themselves and bathe themselves and all that stuff. And of course, is you know, you're. Your new dad now? Is that yeah, right? just a three-month-old. Okay, so that three-month-old is not going to be caring <laughs> himself or herself right away, but um, you know that's eventually that's what happens. So it's a lot more time-intensive at this age, but later on, um, you know, each kid becomes self-sufficient, and so you you focus more on teaching the younger ones how to do it, and then the older ones also um, teach the younger ones and can help take care of the younger ones. So it becomes a lot less time-intensive. And then the real answer, the honest answer, is that my wife helps me tremendously. <laughs> I, I, right now she's taking care of the kids while I do this interview. And, you know, I couldn't do what I do without her. So I don't want to make it seem like I'm Superman yeah. with six kids. Yeah, yeah. Well, amen to that. Having amazing women in our lives is certainly the uh, cornerstone of it all in many ways. Yeah, we're a team. But I definitely yep. think she makes what I do possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Well, I'd love to wrap it up with um, just a quick look at uh, two things. One, your fundamentals, and I'll come back to kind of your number one tip. But do you, and you may not even, well, you do have, you know, your habits. Do you have like a core set of habits that you look at as your fundamentals? Yeah, um, I don't have a list. It's kind of something I'm, I'm still trying to figure out myself, actually. But I know there are a few things um, that really make the most difference. And one 
is is mindfulness, and I think you're you're a big one on that. Is that right? Mm, yeah, attention training, I call it. But yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, attention training, mindfulness, meditation is a practice for that. Uh, but yeah, meditation is a great habit to start with because it trains you for the rest of the habits. It's like kind of one of the key fundamental habits for for learning how to do all the other habits. Um, and I could go a whole mm. day about about why that is, but it's it's super important because you can't really change other habits without that. You know, um, learning to focus your attention or, or pay attention or be mindful. Uh, so that's one uh, key one. And I think the other ones are all kind of just, uh, they spring from that. So I, I love to exercise and run and stuff like that. But those are, are kind of active mindfulness training. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Um, eating healthy is another one that's huge. It's changed my entire life. But that's also a way to pay attention to the food that I'm taking in, what I'm putting into my body, how it makes me feel, and all of that. So eating healthy would be the third one. Um, really paying attention as I spend time with other people is another one. And then another key one, again, this is going back to mindfulness, but it's really about being alone in a room with nothing to do. And I think most people are so uncomfortable with that that they'll do anything <laughs> Other than that, they'll, they'll check their email, check their phone, check Facebook, all these other things because they're avoiding the uncomfortableness of just sitting there, being alone, and being with yourself. And not necessarily doing something for a purpose like mindfulness, yep. you know, meditation, but just what's it like to be there and sit there and do nothing hmm. and be there with your thoughts and what are you like inside and how do you feel about yourself, this person that you're alone with? And do you accept that person? And so all of that is a, maybe a series of habits. But I think that's a key <laughs> thing, is learning to accept yourself. Right. Uh, all of it kind of stems from that mindfulness training. Right on. That's just amazing. Thanks for sharing that. And then really quickly on your meditation, I know, again, we can talk about that for a weekend. But how do you practice? Do you mind sharing? Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not a meditation teacher, and I'm not uh, experienced enough to be able to give advice on that, but I practice as simply as possible, and so I'll, I'll just sit on some pillows on the floor, either facing the wall or with my back to the wall if I don't feel too flexible, <laughs> and um, I try and sit cross-legged, but I'm the, most, the world's most inflexible man <laughs> in Guinness for that, but, uh, not really, but uh, I'm pretty, and I sit with my eyes open, looking down at the floor, hands on my lap, and basically just pay attention to my breath. And, um, and that's it. I just try and uh, notice when my thoughts drift away and I start to think about things and um, just kind of gently return to the breath. And when I'm really good, I don't even need to pay attention to the breath. I'm just kind of fully there, fully experiencing the moment. But that doesn't happen as often as uh, you might think. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Do you have a certain... Uh... I hate to say goal for an amount of minutes, or do you just sit there for uh, however long you feel good? Like, what's your what's your approach, time wise? I have a vow, and I, I learned this from a, a, a wonderful guy named Mark Lesser, who's a Zen teacher mm -hmm. and a writer. He's he got a great book called Less, L E S S. Look it up on Amazon. Um, I, I met with him, and he told me about this Zen monk he met in Japan, um, and this monk had a vow to sit every day in meditation. But the minimum of his vow was three minutes. Hmm. And so I said, that's, that's great. You don't need to worry about 45 minutes or 30 minutes or 20. And those are great times to sit. But if you could just sit for three minutes, that's all you got to do. And so my goal, if you want to call it that, all I tell myself is get your butt on the cushion. And uh, if you can do that, you know, you could probably stay for around three minutes. And if you sit for three minutes, then, you know, we'll see what happens after that. Hmm. So just get your butt on the cushion. That's really all it is. And I, I love think it. as my so-called goal for, for running, I never know where I'm going to go or how long it's going to be or how fast I'll go. But I know that I'm going to get my shoes laced up and get out the door. Mm. And so that's re really it is. Just start. And, um, and that's true for any habit, really. That's fantastic. Absolutely love that. Um, to wrap it up then, do you have a number one tip for us, those of us who want to optimize our lives or whatever stage we're at? 
Yeah, I, I actually wrote a post on it today. So if you go to Zen Habits today, which you probably won't do if you're listening to this, <laughs> uh, go to a post called Savor. And uh, to me, this, this kind of encapsulates everything that we've been talking about, which is about you know learning to savor everything that we do. But it could start with you know some tea. This tea is so light uh, compared to coffee or wine or whatever. It's just you know water with a little bit of essence of leaves, right? <laughs> So you kind of sit there with that cup of tea, and you really pay attention to it. And if you really pay attention, you can taste all kinds of things in it. But you have to really notice it and kind of give yourself some space and allow yourself to let go of everything else that you might do later and next or everything else that might be calling for your attention and just really give yourself the space to sit there with that cup of tea and really pay attention, savor it, enjoy it, relax with it. And if you do that... And you can do that with berries or a small square of chocolate um, or really anything, um, a raisin. You, know? you can really learn to savor that tiny little thing. You can savor anything, and you can take that to sitting there with a book, sitting there with a good friend, writing, something that you might procrastinate on, clear away space for what you want to do and not procrastinate on, and just allow yourself to savor the moment of doing whatever you, do, you want to do. And that can work with habits, it can work with exercise, it can work with healthy eating. Um, really anything that you want to do in life, really allow yourself to give yourself space, pay attention to it, and fully savor it. And when you do that, you can savor life itself. And um, it's one of the most wonderful discoveries I've made. Beautiful. Well, Leo, thank you so much. I appreciate you and your wisdom and your humility and your playfulness and uh, your overall awesomeness. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. I, I love that you've given me the opportunity to talk to the talk about this stuff, share this with people, and you know, talk with someone smart who can uh, give me some good questions. <laughs> <laughs> right on, man. Thank you. Look forward to more. We hope you enjoyed this Optimal Living interview. Please visit brianjohnson.me for more.